Yet another week of gaming is upon us and behind us. Welcome to XEP, discussing all things in the Gamerverse as they pertain to the Xbox ecosystem. And as I want to do each and every week, I like to start the show by offering words of kindness to those who have made my gaming week better. And this week, the words of kindness are extended to my guest, one of the industry legends, Mr. Lauren Lanning, co-founder of Oddworld Inhabitants. Lauren, how are you? I'm great, Luke. Thank for having me. Thank you for having me on. I'm ecstatic to have you on. It is a listener requested interview, which makes me that much more excited because I was familiar with you uh, f- from a number of different projects throughout the gaming industry. And gamers may know you from tentpole titles way back in the PlayStation 1 and PC era yeah. through to the Xbox launch title uh, of Munch's Odyssey. And most recently with, with uh, Oddworld Soulstorm, there are any number of places that people might be familiar with you. But uh, I... I don't know where to start. I do want to tell listeners that we're not going into everything and you must check out this incredible three hour interview with Lauren uh, from Ars Technica. That was just super insightful onto your career. Lauren, how do you prepare for a three hour interview? I have to know that. I don't. <laughs> you know, <that's, laughs> they usually uh, people usually send me questions ahead of time or, you know, the uh, Jim, our, our PR guy will hand them over. Here's the question. I almost never, read ahead of time Mm -hmm. and um uh part of that's just time and pressure you know it's like Mm -hmm. i'll be okay you know i got too much other shit to do but the other part is um there's something about spontaneity and just the reflection of thought as you realize it Mm -hmm. you know this is uh, just what i feel so um if it was if it was something that was going to grind into technical specs or something like that i'd really have to review you know but history is easy to recall and uh, moments are easy to recall so as long as the questions uh provide the breadcrumbs you know i'm happy to chew them up well breadcrumbs galore breadcrumbs galore and and goodness gracious looking back it was just wild to try and track you know when you do your research uh first game you launched that that i could take was abe's odyssey back in 1997 uh is that accurate that's right that yeah. is right. And that is that never, com- never built never was on a game development before that. That was that's the first kind of, game I ever worked on, you know. Yeah, that that's exactly it. That was your first realm. You had a background that took you through uh certain military contracts, different types of animation and digital animation. Uh it, it, somehow, some way, if you go quickly, just kind of sum up some of your touchstone projects leading up to Abe's Odyssey. I would love to hear that. Uh, sure. So I was I was really sort of a storyteller in search of a medium, you know, and it began with painting, right? Not to go through the whole thing, but it was really, I was interested in, in um, incapable photorealism, meaning things that didn't exist, but when you looked at them, you thought they did, you know, that, you know, that type. And this was in the 80s. So as technology started progressing, um, the idea of, of creating uh, became more than just a camera or pencils and, and paints, but it became uh, computer graphics. And all of a sudden, mm-hmm. it was equally terrifying as it was exciting. <clears throat> and people had been trying to uh, convince me of computers earlier, but it, it was really seeing that they could reduce scope and reduce uh, effort reduce time to do things, and most importantly, allow a lot more iterations to get something good. You know, we're in the old mediums, you know, canvas or something, you can only mess with it so far, and mm-hmm. then you ruin the piece, <laughs> there's no undo. And uh, so into projects, you know, that led me to Hollywood from New York. And arriving in Hollywood, I just got there at this terrible time when all the, um, the three, three of the biggest computer graphics companies at in the day in North America, were all acquired uh, in kind of a, a funny Canadian go public story, but it ultimately wound up tanking them all. They all went out of business at the same time, and that was like right a month before I arrived in Hollywood to jump into the business. Mm-hmm. So it was like, oh my god! And uh, so I went back to school, and that's what led me to aerospace, and I didn't expect this but i learned something very valuable there i mean first of all i never expected to be getting a call from someone from aerospace 
but people didn't know the software of 3D, uh, 3D animation, you know, software. Mm -hmm. And back in that day, and we're talking 80, 80, uh, 88, 89. And so I just get this call. It's like, we heard, you know, the software. I was like, yeah. And I, you know, the artist interview really goes into this, but the, the short of it was, was that the only place I was living on credit cards at the time, which is just a terrible pattern to be in, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, and I got this call and I was like, what? And they were like, yeah, you know, the software. And I was like, yeah. And they're like, well, why don't you get down here? You know? And I was like, okay. And I was literally, you know, like mm -hmm. living in debt. And, um, and that turned me out. It was the TRW aerospace visualization lab. And what they were doing was they were visualizing military space weapon projects that were going on under um, Reagan, President Reagan. Mm -hmm. And I never thought I'd be doing something like that. But the the most, but it was basically how how pretty can you make this look? You know, so I was right. still just learning the software, and I was like, anything that I had an opportunity to use at that time was extremely expensive machines. You know, they were like eighty grand for the SGI and another eighty grand for the Wavefront software that was running on it, all Unix based. So it was, it was not easy access at that time. And, and um, so anything I could do on the machine, I just wanted to look as great as possible. And so then it became like satellites and other you know, brilliant pebbles and particle weapons and shit like that. And I was like, oh, we can make this look cooler. We can, you know, whatever. And without going into my sort of uh, philosophical struggles, you know, with just the idea of doing things like that. But, mm -hmm. you know, that that's a granularity we don't go into, need to go into now. But what it taught me was that you could, uh, visualization was extremely powerful because what we were doing in the aerospace was we were basically making what I called commercials for five people or commercials mm -hmm. for five generals. And if they, if they understood what it was, then the, the company TRW might get a, you know, literally a billion dollar contract or more to build this stuff. And so visualization became a very important thing in technology because it was allowing really hard concepts to become visible and not just with paintings and diagrams and storyboards or a narrative speaking over technical documents. It was like, you got to see how it worked. You know, you got to see it. And that, that I was just looking at aerospace to build a reel, you know, to get a good reel going. Cause I, Rhythm and Hughes wouldn't hire me. <laughs> they were the only uh, company at the time that I was really interested in working with. And, uh, and I thought they were working on the cool projects and stuff. And they were had fallen out from Digital Productions and Robert Abel and Associates and Omnibus for anyone, you know, it, old timers in the industry will remember all those names. But uh, in learning how you could use imagery to sell bigger projects, and as a wannabe, as really this like thirsty wannabe storyteller, um, I think a lot of that was desire was just shaped by life experiences and then understanding the potential role of the artist, you know, in the modern world and throughout history. Like, where's the real value of what the artist brings? And so I was like, huh, you know, I want to tell stories and I'm learning about how you can sell bigger projects and and how, you know, a three minute video could be worth a billion dollars if you had the, the means to execute on it, you know, mm -hmm. the, the promise of what you were selling. And so um, when I got to Rhythm and Hughes, I always thought, finally, you know, the, the aerospace work got me a good enough uh, reel, you know, video reel of my work to uh, finally get me a job at Rhythm and Hughes. And they had turned me down like three times already. And that's just a... a uh, I it came out of Manhattan and people were really, um, really competitive and you'd get advice from people, particularly if you were young, up and coming illustrator or something, they'd be like, you keep calling, right? You keep mm -hmm. calling. They, they turn you down. That's okay. You keep calling. Like you don't give up. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> Rhythm is like, I think I got three meetings, but probably did like 12 calls before, you know, I finally got in the door. And it was because of the aerospace work. Now I got to jump on to instantly uh, film work for part of, uh, for theme parks and 
um, film and a lot of commercials back in that day. It was like logos for Olympics, for news channels. Um, you know, that was a big part of where the business was at. Pixar hadn't released uh, Toy Story yet, so no one had yet proven a real 90-minute blockbuster motion picture, you know, like, mm-hmm. a, like a tentpole event that was all CG. And this is what at, time, at a time when, you know, Disney animators were going up on stage at conferences saying, computer animation will never, you know, mm-hmm. turn left and express itself like a character, you know, in, in animation does. And I was actually studying animation at Cal Arts when I got to, when I came to California. I was doing that while I was working. And so I was just having a whole different picture. I was like, no way, man. Animation is going to be everything in the future. And I already had sort of a glimpse of how animation can co-create the future with visualization. And so at that time at Rhythm and Hughes, I started working on you know real entertainment projects, um, larger teams, and learning a lot about teamwork, which really I, I didn't have much experience in before, even at... TRW was just a lab of kind of five radical guys, you know, they all went on to amazing careers. Mm -hmm. But at the time, it wasn't like you had, you know, really, it's just as long as you weren't a jerk, that was one thing, but you weren't involved with 200 person teams on a single project, you know. Mm -hmm. And so it really, then at Rhythm Hughes started getting um, serious doses of a lot of things. One of them was uh, ethical management. And I just have the highest in hindsight. And even at the time, I was like, these people are just amazingly transparent and honest. And um, and they're really just ultra passionate craftspeople at the craft of, you know, engineering computer graphics mm-hmm. and, and the artistry. And uh, what that started to do was it, it was leading me towards, I thought I wanted to create movies with uh, computer animation and without going into the, you know, turn ons or turns offs of Hollywood and everything therein. I just eventually felt like that was too big of a lottery ticket to ride on. It was too, it was too easy to fail. It was too easy to not succeed. You know, it's kind of like saying, I want to be an astronaut. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's like, there's only so many people going to be an astronaut. And, uh, and without having all those interconnections and stuff at Rhythm and Hughes, we start. We were working on um, theme park attractions, but I was really interested in those because I was searching for a place where the, sh- the short f- film had a possibility that would allow us, the creators, to become content creators and just not executors on other people's projects. Mm-hmm. And so. Um, kind of like, you know, that might not make a lot of sense for everyone, but think of it this way, like ILM was never really a content creator. They were a service to LucasArts and other film companies that would go to them for the service of visual effects. But if you were a visual effects supervisor, anyone in that or, or you know, in the hierarchy of things beneath that tree in an effects company, you weren't taken seriously as a content creator, as an IP creator. Mm -hmm. And I started learning that by trying to pitch projects in Hollywood and stuff like that. You'd be in, um, you know, big shots, uh, executive offices, uh, film studios and stuff. And say, we got this thing. And they're like, well, but you guys haven't done any content creation. You didn't Mm -hmm. design the IP. And, uh, we were doing, you know, really, uh, popular things at that studio, the Coca-Cola Polar Bears, you know, a lot of these, uh, the movie right. Babe, um, they went on to do Life of Pi and all kinds of movies, you know, tons of movies, lots of Academy Awards. But what I was starting to realize was that um, the thing, well, let me, let me say this first. Aerospace showed me that the wall was going to come down in Russia and all of these aerospace technology firms were, were going to be trying to salvage their businesses by moving them into the entertainment space. And I started to make the connection because it was already happening. They were making some ride films and we were working on them. And actually, my partner, Sherry McKenna, who I founded Oddworld with, 
was the client from Universal that was bringing in some of those big, you know, Universal Studios theme park attractions that would be films that were synchronized with motion bases. So they became ride films. Mm -hmm. And she got to work with like Douglas Trumbull. I mean, she ran Douglas's uh, business and uh, their executive producer, general manager studio and stuff. And Douglas did, I don't know if you're familiar with Douglas Trumbull, but 2001 uh, mm -hmm. Blade Runner. Right. Know, and, uh, Close Encounters. I mean, just shit that you go back to this day and you look at it and it still holds up. You know, mm -hmm. it's like well, so far ahead of its time. These, these people were brilliant. But what, what I saw by the technology was that uh, computer graphics were kind of an ideal way to to make motion based ride films for theme parks and if we could just start making you know three to four minute films where we were actually writing them we would escalate into the category of content creator we'd mm -hmm. be now we'd be creators and not just service hands you know and um and so i was aggressively in that pursuit because it, you know i just wanted to tell stories right to help the medium of computer graphics sort of be taken more story, more seriously as a uh, medium that could be emotionally compelling, sustaining for you know a couple hours of, of a long film. And uh, are you finding this helpful? Is this? It's you're going very in depth. It's more in depth than I was planning to go. Okay. I'm enjoying it, but I'm gonna I'm mean, I'm gonna have to cut part of it just for time. But I'm okay. really well, enjoying well, it. I'll, I'll speed that up. Okay. So. Um, take that into, I, I'm realizing visualization is very powerful. Mm -hmm. um, becoming a content creator is very powerful. F film is extremely challenging. And then seeing what was happening with video game technology, I realized we could take, we could sort of use the projects that we were doing for theme parks and turn that into a business plan to start a video game company. And actually tried to do that, you know, with uh, Rhythm and Hughes. I think, but they were just very entrenched, you know, in a, in lots of people and lots of business and television and film. And, and, um, so I, I felt like the, the best way to do it was mm -hmm. just to start from scratch so that from the DA, DNA up, you can start a game company. And at the time I was writing all these different stories that were turning into, um, just sort of a, a, a library of assets, of story pieces. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, shots, moments, character quirks, just all these different ideas, taking notes and compounding them. And eventually that started shaping into this property um, that, we, that, we, that became Oddworld. And after five years at Rhythm and Hughes, uh, I convinced Sherry McKenna, and Ars Technica really goes into the detail on this stuff, but I convinced her to start Oddworld and that we could do these games. And that the power of the hardware was just getting to the place where we could de deliver this sort of higher fidelity rendering because we wouldn't be doing real-time 3D, which we didn't bother telling the investors and stuff at the time because I knew everyone wanted to see real-time 3D. But because we understood 3D so well at that time, I knew it was all going to look the same. Well, okay. So let me pause you there. Yeah. Oddworld and Abe, they're tentpole titles. Uh, and images in the people's mind from all the way back to PlayStation and Xbox, the critically acclaimed commercial successes. Uh, and you're just getting up to that. But when you look now back at that legacy, is it surreal to think about where you were then as far as having to pitch your own company to make 3D images and, and, and take it into the next realm as you know, PlayStation 3D were coming about? Is it surreal to look back at that legacy? Um. In some ways, but but in ways that might not be expected, like it was easier to get money then. <laughs> you know, like it, it was, you know, and as industries mature, it gets harder to get money. Uh, How so? Or is this the idea of the smart money and dumb money? Yeah. So, okay. and, and also opportunity for an industry and the mm -hmm. big shift that PlayStation was bringing, you know, kind of 3DO promised it and PlayStation delivered it. Really, mm -hmm. right was cd-rom which meant no longer you know 256k of mm -hmm. or, or uh you know 256 uh, yeah a lot of times it was like 256k of memory or really tiny amounts of memory that uh cartridge games were using and i was just blown away at what people were able to do with that mm -hmm. within such a tiny amount of memory turning into 
really long experiences. You know, like mm-hmm. look at Mario or something. You know, hundreds of hours people would spend, and uh, but it was all, it was all coming off a disc with really limited memory. You know, and so that that chemistry just fascinated me, and so at the time, video games. The one thing that the industry knew was that it was all going to go 3D and games were going to get a lot more expensive and teams were going to get a lot bigger. And um, it was going to, as people would talk about it in a day, evolve out of the garage. Mm -hmm. And it was already past that point, but people would still sort of talk about it in that context, you know, like EA was already huge, you know, big companies existed. But uh, it was still like small teams, you know, a million dollar titles were really rare. And, uh, and so we went out and we said, well, let's, let's, what, what do we think it would take? How smart do we think we could be? And how much do we think we could do it for? And we came off with a figure of like, for three and a half million dollars, we think we can deliver a game. Mm-hmm. And, um, and it, because we had the 3D experience and we had experience in managing large teams, and Sherry had just, Sherry was re- actually legendary in computer graphics in Hollywood uh, before I was, when I was nobody, I mean, totally mm-hmm. nobody. And so the credibility of, you know, I was bringing the creative and Sherry was bringing the producing. It was all this history of winning awards and, you know, highest quality graphics. I think Sherry McKenna had the most Clio awards of anyone in the world, person. Wow. Which was, uh, you know, the best in annual television commercials, and uh, so she, so Sherry just had this incredible legacy, and I was just looked like, you know, maybe a new young guy on fire that was really passionate about making this shit and had done some really good stuff. Sorry about that. And mm-hmm. uh, in that chemistry, money was coming at us because there wasn't a lot of people in the film business that really cared about making games, and it was mm-hmm. hard to try and recruit from the film business for people to make games because if you were an animator or a really hardcore modeler or a scene lighter or a compositor probably a lot of the reason you were doing it was because you just loved the, the cool you know high resolution graphics and doing things people hadn't done before and mm-hmm. it was a kind of exciting time for that and they were like video games you know i'd be like yeah you know this, it's gonna be huge man <laughs> you know just to try and sell them and certain people were like yeah no you know i just i, I like making you know high res stuff or so it was hard the game is the film industry didn't really want to move over the studios wanted to once they saw sonic made like 500 million dollars they, they all wanted to get into games but they didn't want to make games you know mm-hmm. and um and a lot of the graphics people were you know i was a visual effects supervisor by the time i left so i kind of escalated through the career ladder in the visual effects industry kind of fast. And I think a lot of that had to do with um, being a painter first, you know, mm-hmm. lighting had a lot to do with 3D graphics. And, uh, but as all of that was coming together, there was not many people with our kind of resume, skill set, reels of demonstration, putting out high quality work done by large teams, done for millions of dollars. And so it, it wasn't that, it's always a difficult process closing a deal but it wasn't that hard getting the money mm-hmm. and that's what we would say dumb money versus smart money the smart money was the game publishers but they weren't quite sure exactly what they should do the dumb money was the new investors that were buying into the whole silly wood story at the time which is where silicon valley was going to team up with hollywood and start streaming movies and making games together and sharing film assets from the back lots and the sets of most of that didn't happen, right? It took a lot longer for it to actually mm-hmm. happen. But that excitement was right there. What we'll call the dumb money, which doesn't mean they were, you know, it just meant they were dumb to the specific things. Sure. I've, I've had you know, pitched at times with uh, really big investors, like, you know, famous guys. And they go, I just don't, I'm the dumbest guy in the room. I don't, I don't understand what you're saying. So I can't, I can't qualify it. You mm-hmm. know, I, I don't know how to judge it. And uh, that was always interesting learns as well where you have these like brilliant people telling you they're the dumbest guy in the room. <laughs> you know? And I was like, okay, so it was a lot of finesse to get with the whole climb up that ladder. But that money was there at the time. It was easier to secure, but it's more difficult to manage. Mm-hmm. You know, so, you know, 
few few good things come without friction. And uh, and so that launched Oddworld, and we moved out of LA up onto the Central Coast of California to join another company that was owned by the same investor that was backing us. And um, ultimately, together, you know, we we were able to get Abe up the the first one in '97. So that was the that was the first one in '97. You followed it up a year later. No pressure, oh uh, w- which is wild when you think about the turnaround time there. Uh, yeah. Those were ten ten pole PlayStation titles, and then all of a sudden, you're a launch title on the new rival on the block with with the first Xbox. Uh, why the transition? Is that an awkward transition? Can you tell me about the decision to to make the switch? And and did well, anything not go well there? <laughs> a lot of things didn't go well, you know. Like when you were asking me, you know, when you go back to the same surreal, like so much of it seems the same as today because it's it's always really hard, you know. Mm-hmm. It's always no great products get delivered easily you know let's look at you know tesla or spacex or you know how it it, it takes that or the olympics you know people really going for the gold um it's never easy like no one just says you know i showed up at the olympics uh, it was happening i ran a race and i won you know mm-hmm. it doesn't happen right it only happens with people who are training the hardest and working the hardest and really want it and going for it and uh and so, so, you know, that pressure to deliver, one of the things Sherry McKenna was promising was we always deliver on time and on budget. And that was a big thing because in Hollywood, if you, if you failed to deliver for a movie and they had to sh- sh- change their release date, you'd never work in that town again. Mm-hmm. And the same for Madison Avenue. Like if they had a Super Bowl commercial and they had to have it, you know, two weeks and you just, you know, you weren't able to deliver, you'll never work on Madison Avenue again. Mm -hmm. Like everyone's going to know and you're, you know, they don't want to deal with that. You have to deliver. And so uh, that was part of what she was selling. So we didn't even really know what we were doing. Right. So that was just incredibly hard with a lot of pressure and lots of mistakes and huge learning curve. Um, But we pulled it off. And then the second one just just compounded that because you, for, for various reasons, but it was an incredibly short deadline. And I thought the success of the first game of Apes Odyssey was going to give us a little more cushion, a little more buffer. What I failed to see, what, to forecast, was that it, the exact opposite was going to happen. You're now 50% owned by a public company. That public company has... Um, annual, you know, quarterly margins, it needs to make profits, it needs to make. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were in a window where some of the biggest titles that were due under the publisher at the time was GT Interactive, were um, slipping the Christmas date. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And if you can imagine, this is like, one of them was uh, epic, you know, with Unreal. And Mm -hmm. if you can imagine epic wasn't even an office yet. Right. Like if you were talking to like Mark Rain and Tim back in that day, you know, one is in this city, and the other is in, in, in a different city. And GT didn't really, they were like, this company doesn't exist. And it's like, well, they kind of exist, you know, but they work remotely. It was right. truly a virtual company a hit way ahead of its time. But we were all struggling to get shit done. And um, it just so happened that some of the biggest titles slipped for Christmas, but we delivered. Mm-hmm. And then we had, you know, pretty, uh, you know, we got a home run at Christmas and, but the way the, the, uh, board, uh, of the publisher looked at it was what was your biggest performers this Christmas and who can we rely on next Christmas? Mm-hmm. You know, I didn't see that coming at all. Like I thought if we made a game and we had success, um, we would be afforded a little more confidence and leeway to now build a better game next you know, like really a, a better game. And actually, uh, Exodus was a better game. You know, it, wa- it was. Uh, mm-hmm. I think the crowd, you know, there's been lots of uh, polls and stuff, but it seems like that's that was one of the favorites. Mm-hmm. But because of that pressure, that pressure was now, you know, put to us of like, you can do it, just deliver the next game in a quintology. And I was thinking more of Soulstorm's story rather than Abe's Exodus story. And so if you, if you think of it reverse like that, you go, I, I need, 
this is a three year production that we're going to enter into. And it was like, yeah, you can get it done by Christmas, whatever you need. Mm-hmm. Right. So you're in that spot. It's like, it's going to cost a lot more. we got to hire a lot of people. No problem. Go mm-hmm. for it. You know, it was like, Oh shit. And so now if you, if you look at the two scripts of each game, I was thinking more along the lines of Soulstorm. Like really, what is this brew? How is it planting deeper seeds in a, in a more miserable journey for Abe who's going who's gonna to bear through it? You know, mm-hmm. I really wanted that set up. It wasn't just an IP that was, you know, a comedy, right? Or a mm-hmm. dark comedy. And uh, so now we only had nine minutes, months and we had killed ourselves to deliver Abe's Odyssey. I mean, man, people, we all work so hard which was very common in game development, you know? Um, but we just worked so hard. So we were ready for a break and it didn't come. In fact, now it was the, the sprint of your life. Mm-hmm. It was like, oh shit. Now, I guess you could have said no, you know, but you have 50% partners and that can really. Yeah. Bills need to be paid and whatnot. Yeah. And uh, you know, you don't, when the relationship was on such a high, we didn't want to take it low, you know? Sure. And um so we said we'll do it and uh and then i was like shit how do we do it and so so we were taking the fundamentals of like the brew and the addiction and into this and and uh just you know tried to manage and uh, a couple guys that were really at the helm of that was uh uh chris ohm who had uh joined us and he was previously the founder of malibu comics Mm -hmm. And pretty amazing, amazing uh, sort of business and talent, you know, like writer, creator, talent. And um, and another guy, Paul O'Connor, uh, were really, really close in the sort of conception of like, what do we do for the story now that we've got to deliver it, you know, in nine months? Um, and how do we make the game better? Because we all hated the engine we were on. And so the idea was we were going to build a new engine so our life would be better. But not only did we not get to build a new engine so our life would be better, we had to use the same shitty engine. And it was, you know, there's lots of reasons engines are shitty, right? I'm not saying whoever wrote it was shitty. It was just mm-hmm. the engines were have always been an Achilles heel. And um, the, the, the challenge of like going, we got to start now and we don't even have the story right, you know, so these guys really, I think, did an awesome job. Uh, and there was, you know, uh, the various people in on the on the game design that were, were critical. You know, the team came together. Uh, but it was hard. And so the story wound up being something that delivered. I've heard people say twice the game and half the heart. You know, it was, mm-hmm. uh, and I thought it had to be twice the size just to be viable as a sequel. Mm-hmm. Because of the way people were looking at the value of games back in that day, and I think I judged that wrong, but um, to, to to concatenate that story, it was incredibly challenging, and then uh, I was really uh, kind of upset because it derailed the uh, larger five part epic that I had hoped to tell, and so we said we'll do it, but you're not calling it part two of the quintology; you're going to call it a, a bonus game, and they were like, mm-hmm. yeah, whatever, you know, and. Uh, so so then the IP was able to take a little bit of a direction out of necessity that wasn't necessarily aligned with the dream of where that story was going. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, that's just reality, right? You, you know, reality hurts. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> if, if, you know, the thing is surviving it. And um, so I think that, that's a long-winded answer, sorry, but to, to a pretty concise question that you had. <laughs> well, in, in arriving with the Xbox launch, uh, to to oh, make right. the jump to that, yeah, yeah. Tell me about that. Okay, sorry, I went down that rabbit hole. So that was. So now we come out of Exodus, and PlayStation Two is starting to ramp in, and um, it's not out yet. But uh, if you recall. Phil Harrison showed it early and swore it was real, a re- early demo of Metal Gear Solid 2. Mm-hmm. And when everyone saw that, we were just blown away. And it was like, how do we get dev stations? We need to be on that. You know, we, 
everyone was feverishly trying to get on the PS2, and it was really hard to get dev stations, and, and they were super expensive. You know, they were, excuse me, I think they were 15 grand or so. Mm -hmm. That's a lot for smaller studios, for sure. Much less. Yeah. Big ones. And then ideally, you know, there's it at minimum one in every department, you mm -hmm. know, and uh, it was really hard to get them because like the EAs and the, the big kind of the Activisions, Ubisoft, they would get there's a lot of other developers at the time, Acclaim, they were getting the the initial early dev stations because they were going to be delivering huge projects for them, you know, and the, mm -hmm. um, the heart platform maker wanted those projects. So the thing that we didn't see coming was that uh, I call it a kudaragiism, which it was the PlayStation was pretty great. The PlayStation 2 was uh, a strange combination of a series of chips and cell chips and ways that it strange unseen before ways of synchronizing chips and different types of memory and you know a, a more a, a wider circuit board of, of technology that was uh, communicating to itself mm -hmm. and basically if you go back at that time First party Sony didn't release a title on PlayStation 2, if I'm correct, until a year after it released. And there was a reason for that, because that's how damn hard it was to develop for that machine. And the the big problem there that the you know game players rarely ever get to hear about is that as a game development studio that was independent, you had to raise money to get it project financing now you're starting to get into the millions of dollars but if you're not delivering on time or if you're going on over over budget that deal gets worse for you with time because every time you have to go back to the money well the terms depreciate for you even though you're going to wind up doing more work mm -hmm. and that's because you couldn't accurately forecast what a budget would be because you, because you just it was no one had deep enough access to really understand how it worked. So you had certain companies like uh, Insomniac, but what mostly comes to mind to me is um, uh, Naughty Dog, because they had people like Andy Gavin who were just brilliant machine level engineers, right? Like machine level code. Mm -hmm. And they'd get in there and they'd start, they were doing it on this original PlayStation and that became part of their backbone. And so they were doing cra things with Crash Bandicoot. Other people just couldn't figure out how to do they were, they were, you know, jockeying around the system. And they were also very close with Sony. So, you know, they got a little more access. And for us, it was very difficult. For many developers, it was very difficult. We were getting in trouble. We thought we were going to go, go out because we couldn't estimate and we couldn't get our hands around how much the title would actually cost. And at times, you know, you had Kudragi saying things like, Oh, people say our system is difficult, but um, that's not a bad thing because it'll just weed out the the uh, poor programmers. And it was like, what did he just say? You know, so it was it was kind of offensive mm -hmm. because it wasn't just saying, hey, it was it's a new generation of hardware. We've evolved into new technology, and, and there's a bit of a hard curve here that we all need to really embrace. You know, mm -hmm. and and so it made it way more expensive. And as a, a leap from that, we the Xbox started to emerge and they were really seizing the opportunity to answer a problem that the industry was having, which was how difficult the development environment was and how much it was escalating the costs of projects. And so Microsoft and Shame, you know, Seamus Blackley and Kevin Bacchus and the rest of the guys up there were saying, look, why don't we just, I, I guess it was Seamus came up with, why don't we just create our own machine? You know, mm -hmm. why don't, why don't we get, take on Sony? And this became like a, a big thing. And when the development community was hearing that Microsoft might be building a really solid developer friendly console. Now at the time, Microsoft had a, a brand problem in the entertainment space. So there was a lot of skepticism, right? They're like, they make windows, they don't make movies, they don't make great 
games, you know, they were, they had a game division that was making great games run by Ed Freeze. Mm-hmm. And they were doing like simulator games. And there was a number of great games that came out of there. But the point was the larger entity of Microsoft taking over and coming out with a console. Does that mean it's going to be like a DOS system? You know, mm-hmm. so there was a lot of skepticism. And um, Microsoft had a lot of brand uh, perception to bow- battle ahead of them. But they knew it, you know, and that was you were like, well, whoa, whoa you want to do what? And, and how are you looking at it? And it was mm-hmm. an incredibly huge opportunity to keep your studio alive. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's mm-hmm. actually true. And so we were like, we got to get on the Xbox because, you know, we don't know how long this will take to deliver on the PS2. And if you don't know how the machine really works, how do you really design for it in a way that's going to make the machines shine? So these, these problems were compounding. Microsoft comes along with a solution and, um, and it's being built by, you know, people that had built games and Ed Freeze had a lot of, uh, a lot of fans in the development community. He just had this kind of incredible, he wanted to back and support games that were really pushing the medium of what games could be, you know? And so if you go back to that moment in time, not only was it life-saving, but it was um, really exciting because you, you, you saw these, if once you started getting close to the Xbox group, uh, you saw this this fierce fight that they were going through inside Microsoft, which is, you know, any big, huge, financially powerful company, you know, comes with. And you want to go <laughs> suggesting ideas that they should invest billions of dollars into, which is what the Xbox was, that you're going to have a, you're going to be challenged. You know, they're going to run you through the ringer just to make sure you're, you're going to pull it off. And, um, so that just meant there was this team of excitement that was kind of like people were migrating from the rest of Microsoft and trying to get into the Xbox group. And you had, oddly enough, you had more of a startup vibe happening with this camp, but that camp of people had direct access to Bill Gates and Steve Ballmer. And, and so, you know, you were building games and now you're, you're actually – you know, six degrees of separation and less two degrees of separation from the richest people in the world. Mm-hmm. And that was really sort of changing the stakes. And it was really exciting. And people were super passionate and they were fighting for it and, uh, and they delivered. And so that was, that was how we got onto the Xbox without going through the dramas of the publisher acquisitions that were happening, you know, on our home, home front. Um, it was really kind of a lifesaver for us be- because of that that budget challenge that we were having, which made me a little obnoxiously critical of PS2 at the time. But, you know, when you're losing the fight, <laughs> you, know, you lose your cool too. So uh, that's how it was at that time. You know, it's funny you mentioned acquisitions. You had to contend with that then, the PS2 era after making two hit games and then launching into the Xbox One's launch. And that's a big deal there as well. Uh, you mentioned the acquisition elements. It seems to me that acquisitions are coming up more and more of late over the last few years. And and it's, you can't, you know, scroll your Twitter timeline without seeing the word acquisition. Uh, Does industry consolidation give you pause in any way? Or, and how do you view that uh, kind of given the flux that your studios have gone through? I think that uh, anything, anytime you're, you're down to two or three companies that, you know, control an industry uh it's a little stifling right Mm -hmm. it's kind of like you have a duopoly or something or triopoly uh and and the industry at that time was two things it was console games or pc games that was it you know there was no cell phones games back then you know no free to play no social games social networks weren't even invented yet and um that that so today what constitutes the game industry is i don't even know how to get my arms around it quite frankly mm-hmm. you know there's there's um I, I can't tell you how many surprise times i was surprised to just just bump into another mobile company that would be in san francisco and it would have 600 employees and i never even heard of it but it was a games company you know 
before that, you know, back in the PlayStation One era, you pretty much knew who everyone was developing uh, that was putting out good stuff, who they were in the world. The last time I was at E3 in recent history, I think there was 700 mobile games releasing per day on the planet. Per day. Wow. So, you know, we, we think we see a lot of games. You're not seeing anything compared to what's releasing. You know, like what's really out there. And, uh, and then what happened with social? You know, each time there was like this, it seemed like people that were struggling in the industry, groups that were struggling in the industry would seize a new opportunity kind of out of necessity, you know, like they needed to. And then, uh, so that in the early days of mobile, the AAA developers just weren't interested in it. But the people that did seize it became, you know, some of them became enormous, like enormous. And the same thing happened with social games. When they started, the entrenched publishers, the entrenched uh, developers, they, they didn't really want to build for it. They were building, you know, AAA stuff. But people that were struggling uh, outside of that, for whatever reasons, you know, it doesn't mean they weren't doing good work, but there's a lot, of, a lot of moving parts, a lot of things that can go wrong for a company. They were, they would seize it. And then you have like, you know, Mark Pincus with Zynga, right? It's like the guy is refinancing a home and just places it all on red and hits, you know, mm -hmm. became, becomes a multi-billionaire, um, you know, just because you realized how Facebook could distribute games. They just had to be different types of games and monetize in a different way. So today, now we have, Everything's being gamified. Every piece of uh, exercising equipment seems to be coming with Bluetooth or, or a, uh, you know, internet connection, Wi-Fi that is running competitions. And if you're on your bicycle, you could be racing people around the world on your exercise equipment, right? That's gaming. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. com combine that with the health aspects. You may have seen uh, Deepwell DTX uh, emerging, you know, uh, uh, Medicinal gaming is now emerging. Um, there was announcements that's that's Mike Wilson, and uh, from the game industry, you know, starting up with the medical industry. It's like gaming ther design. therapy. Yeah. Okay. Game, gotcha. Gaming as medicinal therapy, and uh, this is going to be a huge space. Gaming as medicinal therapy because it's already doing it. See, this is what's is that... so weird. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, no, I was, I'm thinking about the way the Wii and the Kinect kind of made their way into non-hardcore gamer homes. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that, you know, Deep Wealth DTX and this video game therapeutic aspect, that is kind of the next stage of that. People finding a market and wanting to enter it and they don't need to be the major player because the name Xbox, PlayStation, Nintendo, that could be sending some people off of it. So if you've got your treadmill and it's gamified, if you've mm -hmm. got therapy methods and it's gamified that could be more enticing to the non-gamer does that make sense does that track sure and what's happening is is uh it absolutely makes sense so if you look at like um you know benny terry's our, our uh, partner and uh he produced the uh soul Stone. and you know it was, we've been working together for a while but benny's uh he was an olympian bicyclist and when I, a lot of his game ideas, they're coming out of um, what he's what he gets on all the rewards to keep on pushing you to work harder in your workout, right? And he's like, mm -hmm. nah, it needs to be another stimulus hit because I don't think I'm going to get up that hill unless I know I can get in, get another achievement, you know. Mm -hmm. So the the uh, the churn of gaming got interpreted by the fitness industry. Uh, to become more gamified and it realized people could get healthier, you know, just, just from that dopamine hit of, of feeling like you're part of a community, you're excelling in that community or you're supported by that community, but really you're just practicing on your rowing machine or your bike, you know, there's mm -hmm. something to that. And when it comes to just to touch on the therapeutic value of gaming, um, Oddworld had a surprising a number and, and, and a lot of companies have experienced this, but a surprising number of, of players that claim that they didn't do terrible things to themselves or you know, suicides or because of the games. And some of these stories went on to national news, you know, for Oddworld. Mm -hmm. um, 
And and you look at it and you go, let me just give you a really grim statistic. Uh, one that's not talked about is um, England did a study over COVID. And the suicide rate amongst youth was five times higher throughout lockdown. Mm. But was what was also higher throughout lockdown was gaming. Right, gaming exploded with COVID lockdown. So there'd be a correlation, but perhaps not a causation. I, the opposite, which is how many people didn't do that because they still had social connection in a team, in a squad, in a clan. Um, they still were connecting. They were still strategizing. They were still using their mind and socially interacting when a lot of people were denied that. Interesting. And, and so how many lives were saved because of gaming? Now, because of the, the experiences that we had, and like that ours interview, we get into details of specific cases that are just mind blowing. But we knew, and I felt this because from day one, I always felt like if you're going to make entertainment, why not try to make it more nutritious? If you were going to make food, why not try to make it more nutritious, right? Mm -hmm. And I just had that kind of philosophy in life of like, games can be a lot of things, but maybe they can be something that makes you feel, feel better, not just because you won, which has value, but because you think about something more contemplative, like a great book or a great movie would give you, you know, mm -hmm. and those are things you can use in life, right? Like deeper contemplation gives you a different reflection and, a, and different perspectives and you can solve problems that way, you know, like life problems. And so uh, just some, some people, I mean, some people really get massive dopamine hits from gaming. Some people get it from the fame of being uh, like World of Tanks or Warcraft, you know, what level were you, who, what, what clan were you? And then they'll show up in forums and all of a sudden people are just like, oh my God, you're these guys, you know, and then everyone wants advice and everyone's like, what that does for the uh, human psychology, you know, of the person who's getting recognition, there's, if you could buy that in a pill, would you? Gotcha. That's a good philosophical question. Now, how much money do people pay with therapists that are just, <laughs> that aren't helping them? Right? That right. aren't changing. I talk to people, like, oh, she's been my therapist for 22 years. I was like, oh, that's what you call it, therapist? I call mm. it a con job. 22 years without an answer, just so you can pay someone a fortune to go talk? Mm -hmm. Like, really? Is that, you know, what's really going on there? Um, and I don't mean a dog, you know, psychology. That's, that's not my angle at all. I'm just saying, like, if you could get, how did you feel when you won that game? Or how does the gamer feel? And this is one of the reasons we wanted infinite, infinite lives. How does the gamer feel if it was hard as hell, but, and they so wanted to see that next part of the story, and they hate you, the designer, for making it that way? But mm -hmm. when they get it, how, how happy are they? Yeah, it's that risk reward, but also the the feeling of elation when you succeed. I think you've seen a lot of those conversations around the Soulsborne games and recently Elden Ring and totally. you know, that successful moment of I accomplished this, I conquered that. If you could buy it in a pill, would you buy it? I think that's drugs, isn't it? In a lot of ways. In a lot of ways, right? So if we go... Um, you know, uh, without getting into the nuances of what, what type of drugs and stuff, but, but we say, let's just take aspirin, right? Do you feel better that you had an aspirin because you had a headache? I think usually you just feel like, oh, I don't have the headache and that's the benefit. It's not like a. Exactly. You're not even hot. getting an elation, right? I don't know of any over the counter drugs that will give you an elation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, the ones I know are all illegal, right? Mm -hmm. Right. But, uh, uh, and I'm not encouraging that. I'm just saying. So, so if you think about it that way, you go, wait a minute, what do therapists get paid for? What do, you know, to help people see a better way uh, that they can reflect differently on themselves. And hopefully it gives them more tool to man more tools to manage the complexities of life and challenges of life, right? And hopefully they're happier. And so you go, are games doing that already? And then we say, you know, maybe some, some uh, like, like here was a correlation because I, I went to Washington 
couple of times. Uh, it was really interesting people there, the Federation of American Scientists, which was uh, formed out of the Manhattan Project scientists that were concerned about nuclear regulation and how nuclear waste was being stored. You know, really interesting people, that smart people that wanted good causes. So a lot of it was the scientists in Washington that were, uh, at the time, you know, some of those people were advisors to the, uh, to the Clinton campaign in the White House, you know, as uh, technology advisors. Right. And they really wanted to see, like, they believed that games could make better education. And we know it could. But then you have, do people really want people to be better educated? Like these are things that you kind of have to see how some decisions are made and they analyze it for a while. You'd be like, no, no not, not necessarily. For Just to point something out, there's no public schools in the United States that teach personal finance management. Don't I know it? <laughs> <laughs> right and and why because poorer people are easier to control people in debt are easier to control without jumping off the population control which is one of my favorite <laughs> subjects to research through history um without jumping off that ledge it's just true right so the mm -hmm. church would promote have your babies because they knew that people with families had had more responsibilities and they were less likely to be planning devious stuff against the state. You know, communists understood it really well. Right. Uh, so my point is, is that games started giving people a uh, connection that they weren't getting. We were watching a lot of interesting phenomena. It was like maybe someone uh, has an unfortunate disfigurement for, for whatever reason. And that has seriously uh, arrested development and social growth and, uh, you know, uh, outward expression. I mean, there's all kinds of things that happen when people don't fit into a society or they, they feel like they're standing out in a way that, you know, doesn't make them feel good. We saw that some people that you would certainly, you know, um, would, would admit to being in that category were because of online games they were having deeper relationships with people than they had ever had before. We had people working at odd world that met on EverQuest and got married, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, would that ever have happened in real life? What happens when people's build relationships before they see what the other person physically looks like? Right. Like if you think that's about a these very, things, yeah, it's a very deep thought there. Yeah, you, you think about these things, you know, and the societal impact and how we behave as organisms. And um, we we saw things you'd be like, you know, this the skinniest guy wound up with the heaviest girl. You know, it was it was like it just seemed like that that wouldn't happen, but it totally did, and it was totally wonderful. And it was happening because of games, because games were allowing people to have a mask. And if you go back in human history, the mask is uh, there's there's reasons for masks. And people let go of a certain piece of their uh, ego and um, facade when they have a mask and they can do something that that doesn't look like it's them. And that's kind of what the avatar is. You know, we get to, uh, you don't know who you're meeting in the game. <laughs> you're seeing right. a mask of, of someone behind it. So I found all these these things really really interesting and so I, I know i took us off course from the the core question of uh you know what where gaming is today and how we see it but honestly gaming is so many things now and i think uh, it's going to become so many more things it's it's almost like it's going to integrate into the fabrics of all levels of society whether it's uh rewards working in a company uh everything what what the world has learned is that everything gets more engaging with gamification. Mm -hmm. I wonder if uh, you could comment a bit about subscription services and how that impacts kind of the user experience. And then you guys on the developer side, we have tiered systems like the recently announced changes to PlayStation Plus. You also have Xbox Game Pass and the ability for developers to launch into there at, at various sizes of games. Mm -hmm. uh, could you comment a bit on, on how those subscription services uh, are, are viewed in your eyes as someone who's kind of been there cutting the deals, jumping systems at various times to make sure the things get done? 
Well, um, th it's, you know, it's, it's kind of a double-edged sword. Uh, let me give you an example. I'll give you an example is, and it's around Soulstorm, is we, out of necessity to get the project done, and we were, um, you know, hitting, hitting a number of uh, leg technical debt, legacy issues, and talent issues, and, you know, the game industry is emerging fast, huge companies are paying fortunes, we're just independent self-financers, harder to retain, harder to contract companies, a lot of shifting uh things in the landscape you know shifting sands and the sony was uh like hey um we you know why don't we do a deal and we were i i think we were making a ps5 you know look look kind of cool and um they were like why don't we do a deal and the way we were working out the intention of a deal was that we would be free for a month on plus, uh, but we were supposed to deliver in January. So at that time, there wasn't going to be any game machines. I mean, you, we were like, how many could we possibly sell? No one ever penetrates more than like 10%, 11% on a, on a new launch. You know, even the most successful titles, you think like, oh, everyone bought this title for that new machine. But then you find out, man, 20% is enormous if someone got that on a new launch right a single title and uh and then covid just completely uh you know kicked us in the gut because we were distributed development across the planet now every studio that we're working with is going into lockdown so now we had you know a number of studios in the mix and now all of a sudden they're all locked down and everyone's working from home and no one can hand a controller next to them to the other person that's how you build games Right. So I never would have said if we said, oh, COVID's going to lock down, you're just going to have to deliver the game, you know, with no one working together. It was like, we can't do that. I never would have said we can do that. But it was forced upon us and we had to, you know, figure out how to prevail. But that's a long way of saying we, we needed the money to complete the project. And we thought we did a pretty good deal because we were like, well, we got this much money and and in January, we'll, we could, there's no way we'll sell more than this. And that's more than the, that's less than the most we could sell is less than the money we could get. So that seems like good. Let's do the deal. So we did the deal. Now at no fault to Sony's just, you know, co and then COVID happened, right? This delayed us from January to April. The deal is still for one free month. What we thought was that we might, maybe sell like 50,000 units at launch, you know, or, or you know, maybe 100,000. It was pretty small numbers because there wasn't going to be a lot of PS5s and lockdown had affected, it looked like it was going to affect the number of machines manufactured as well. So there would be shortages at retail, which for our deal would be, you know, kind of a good thing, right? Think, looking at it selfishly, it would be kind of good because then there wouldn't be as many game machines out there to get the free game. Mm -hmm. But because it slipped to April, uh, we had the highest downloaded game on PS5. And it was, I think, approaching, uh, at the end of the day, close to 4 million units or something like that for free because they were all subscription. And so this was the free game for that month to subscribers. So for right. us, it was devastating. Um, and so that's how kind of the economies would work. Before you had free months, you know, you might, make a deal on a certain number of units at a certain price, you know, you might have, mm -hmm. you, there's different ways to do it, but right. that's how slipping can really sting the developer, right? No one did a dirty deed, you know, there's no one, no one played unfair pool. Right. This is just, you know, earth in 2020 and 2021. And so it's, it's yeah. wild to think that for, uh, uh, you know, getting 4 million versus, you know, a hundred, couple hundred thousand, you'd think it's a good thing. Right. Not, not when they're free, but not when they're free. Interesting. Now that's a, a free service versus like a, a, a game pass system, which on the outside, it, it, it's not the same thing on the developer side. Cause outside looking in, we hear about different deals that go to different studios. Uh, do you yeah, think it would have I mean, played we, similar? I think, uh, and honestly, I'm not the expert on the nuances between the services. Mm-hmm. 
but um, I think that I think that's a lot of the reason why Microsoft is, was buying so many studios was because if people were like, wait a minute, we're only selling into Game Pass, mm -hmm. you know, or or we're like, what does that mean? They don't they don't pay for games anymore. You know, what is the actual behavior of the demographics that's doing it? Sure, it's engaged in it, and I so I think what this is this is me just uh projecting you know i'm not um uh, i'm theorizing because i don't have i'm not speaking as a witness you know to decisions that were being made sure but so in my mind microsoft thought if you could get on game pass and you're getting special you know access to games then it's more the netflix model mm -hmm. right you're not so much paying individually you're just paying the network and and I think they were thinking about it that way. You know, I think some of the people were for sure. Um, I can't say that that was the decision making, but if you if you think about Netflix as the future, it kind of makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so, but I think the developers and publishers look at that more, mostly developers, because the publishers are going to be going bigger. Publishers are going to be going for the triple A's, and they're not going to give shit away. You know, you're going to pay dearly for whatever. You know, Assassins is going to do or Call of Duty is going to do if you want any kind of exclusivity as a pla as a platform. You know, right? But uh, for the smaller developers, there were, you know, in and for independent developers, you know, I think of uh, of uh, uh, you know Tim Tim Schafer's company and Double sure. Fine, and, and uh, you know others that were acquired in there, right? Similar caliber, like really good companies, but small. Lot, crowdfunding things like this mm -hmm. i think microsoft knew that if they didn't acquire the companies and provide those development teams uh dare i say maybe a happier life you know mm -hmm. like we'll we'll buy your company you guys can get whole and and just do your thing and keep building good games and i honestly think that's a big part of where, where Phil Spencer's coming from. Cause, and I think Phil Spencer and uh, uh, Chris Charla, you know, the roles that they played, I thought that was really interesting for Microsoft because I, I think they were kind of perfect people for the roles because mm -hmm. they, they really had a lot of experience and they were, they were not executives who came from other industries and just got into games. They were always games, mostly, you know, almost like hardcore. And uh, Phil Spencer was there on the original Xbox launch, you know, um, not running it like he is today. But I think that his idea, and I can't say we've talked about it, you know, but I, I think what his idea was, if we can acquire the developer, give the developer a better life. Uh, and you'll never understand how hard it is for a developer until you're a developer. You know, this is just how it is. And if we can give them a better quality of life and they can get whole on their effort from years of work, uh, then, then they'll, and we allow them to build great games that they want to build, that they'll be happier and they won't be as concerned about how much, how many sales the game is going to do. So that kind of equation got removed through acquisition. I think with the promise of still like, you know, like who wants to tell Tim Schafer what kind of game to build? Right. Yeah. Right. If you, because that's constricting to a very creative mind. Yeah. Or Brian Fargo. You know, look what they do on their own. You know, like like who's gonna? Uh, you know, there's a number of people that uh, got wrapped up in that acquisition spree. But if you're them, you go, okay, so we can. You know, my colleges, my kids' colleges are paid for, <laughs> and I get to make cool games and get paid well. You know, I yeah. don't give a shit how many they sell anymore because they're giving them away. I don't, I don't think you could get people to be building those qualities of games unless you had an offer like that mm -hmm. to entice them to do it. So I guess that's again a, a long answer to it. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, Luke. It's great. No, I'm in, I'm enjoying the insight, and I think I'm gonna very bluntly say I'm gonna do a consolidated portion where I, I split some stuff, and then I'm gonna do the extended one. Uh, as well and send it to both because it's just really cool stuff like i'm oh, thanks that's very what much... technica did you know yeah. <laughs> mine was the first extended one because the editor was like we shouldn't cut it you know? yeah and then that's they started so cool. their extended series but i was 
I was thrilled with that. Yeah. Well, you're going to be the first XEP extended interview for sure. That's there's no doubt about that because I don't want to cut the content, but I am going to trim it for one of the episodes for sure. Sure. Um, so tell me, you know, we've talked about subscription models and then kind of if you track back a bit, you talked about E3 and kind of the benefits of E3 and getting to see the early ones. Uh, the ESA recently canceled E3 officially. We know that, that we, we knew they weren't going to do an in-person one this year, COVID related or otherwise. Then the, there was no mention of a digital one. Writing seemed to be on the wall. They've come out now and said E3 is not happening this year. How does an announcement yeah. like that play for you? You were there in the early days. And, you know, yeah, I talked to Chris Johnson yeah. and some of the other people that have, have been on here. Stephen Frost was on last week. And yeah. it's, it's, it's got to be well, wild. You know, I was kind of um, – with the E3, I had sort of lost a lot of love for it because I was hearing a lot of the uh, stories about how costly it was becoming and how publishers were feeling gouged on uh, rates and you know there was just some things that were going on occasionally that was really you know like someone couldn't afford i don't remember who it was but someone couldn't afford a floor space so they figured out they could rent a lot across the street and then they set that up all legally and then e3 shut them down like, is that devolver I, that sounds like a devolver move i don't might know who have, it was <laughs> devolver, never underestimate the cleverness of those guys right devolver but um it might have been, I don't remember exactly. Uh, you should have Mike Wilson on sometime, you know, if you if you haven't had him on. You know, he's 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 got an interesting look on things. That's a good idea, writing that one down. <laughs> okay. And uh, uh, it, so they were doing things. I and mean, I think what happened was the E3 parked tractor trailers in front of their parking lot they had rented so no one could see it. I remember this sound now. Yeah. Yeah. I think that was it. You know, I don't remember personalities that were involved, but that, that can, that type of behavior can lead to people feeling like they're, you know, um, that it's not a, I don't know. Business is always tough, but, but that seems a little, uh, dirty pool, you know? Right. And so I think a lot of companies, uh, were were starting to pull out and part of it was positions on um i just knew this from back channel conversations that were happening be like why did why did so-and-so publisher just drop out of the esa and are they going to be at e3 anymore like those things were connected so esa was is you know a big part of what it does it's a lobby group to washington dc Right, like, Interesting. like the, the fans think about it like it's. Um, I mean, it can be a lot more things. I, you know, I, I, I was close to it with uh, when Douglas Lowenstein was running it, and I was on the board of the AIS, which he was as well. A lot of really cool people. That, you know, there's a lot of cool people that uh, gaming names that were on that board doing good things. But um, at that time, the game industry had a big problem with Washington D.C. Because Washington D.C. was having, uh, it, it was getting vo very vocal about game, games and violence and Tipper Gore and um, ratings didn't exist, so the ESA figured out and uh, hired Douglas uh, Lowenstein to run it that they needed a presence in in Washington D.C. that and they needed a rating system. Because without that, it was like you know, <laughs> games were coming out like Mortal Kombat, uh, Mortal Kombat and stuff. Mortal yeah, Kombat I remember that became, story. Mortal Kombat became the documentary about all this, but uh, Mortal Kombat, yeah, you know, we were pulling out spines and the finishing moves and you know all that, and just gratuitousness was was going through the roof. And now that you could do those kinds of details, you know, gamers wanted, wanted to, and gamers wanted it, and uh, so some. So, so politically, uh, Doug Lowenstein was a lobbyist in, and, um, kind of a great guy to run it in my opinion back then. And, uh, so if you understand the game industry didn't have a, a rating system, but it was starting to, you know, show pretty violent stuff and sexualized stuff. 
and uh and then grand theft auto's coming out you know, to, to, uh, you know uh, uh rockstar is, is starting to emerge and shortly the, you know around the same time it's just crazy you know cool content and um so washington was seizing that i think you know like they do anything an opportunity to uh shake down an industry you know and uh but something happened that kind of destroyed that attack and i think one of the key elements was i mean i think like uh, patty vines at esrb is it played a big role in this history douglas sloanstein played a big role in this history and what they what happened was as violent gaming I mean, totally caught fire and just the industry was exploding and all these, you know, approaching billions of people playing. Violent crime amongst youth was going down. So if what they were theorizing was true, if what Jack Thompson was theorizing was true, and he lost his, uh, he was disbarred right after my debate with him. And, uh, Anyway, if I had something to do with that, wonderful, right? Mm -hmm. But, <laughs> but uh, uh, you know, do you remember Jack Thompson? He was trying I to sue do. He was the lawyer. He carried around the he, poster board in the room that one time. Yeah, he, he was going around and trying to convince the families of uh, mass shooters that it was the game's fault. Right? So, I do so, remember that. Yep. yep. You know, that's what he was trying to do. And... Um, but how are you going to hold up that argument that games turning people into psychopaths when psychopathic behavior is going down amongst the key demographic that's playing games? You know, so you right. got like this. Go ahead, keep selling that shit and see how far it goes. How far it goes because the data is not on your side. You know, I often so have to explain to parents yeah. that every major war in human history, on the major epic scales of, of slaughter, took place prior to video games being created. So it wasn't the games that was doing it, you know? Yeah, Stalin wasn't playing games. Right? Exactly. Yeah. And uh, so um, I think I think that was a, a huge part of what was going on at that time. And to, I think E3 was also, you know, created out of the, it was created out of uh, ESA, of course. But I think part of that was, you know, also the game industry was being treated like second class citizens as CES in in chicago mm -hmm. and so ces was the e3 before e3 right except the game industry was like all in the tents in the parking lots and the car stereos and porn had inside you know mm -hmm. and uh so as the game industry got more powerful it created e3 and that was the history of that but then you know we touch on like e3 changed and la it's a reason why film production is moving all, all over the world because LA is a terrible place to shoot. It has all the talent and they, but they'll ream you for fees and insurance and this and that. And, you know, no one has figured out how to milk the film industry like the cities, the city of Los Angeles. Right. That's why mm -hmm. all this shit's being shot in, you know, Asia now and uh, wherever, you know, a lot of in Vancouver, all over the world because mm -hmm. they're trying to stay avoid uh the reaming of los angeles you know right makes sense yeah makes sense so hopefully that answered that question indeed it does indeed it does uh lauren i can't thank you enough for your time today i so thoroughly enjoyed hearing the insight and the directions that you're able to take take stuff it was fascinating and educational and i i can't thank you enough um, I would be remiss if I didn't invite you and ask you to please let people know where they can check out not just your, your work, but uh, the games and they're available in so many places. Now let them know uh, what they can look uh, where they can okay, find well, stuff. <laughs> Thanks for that. Well, the recent ones, you know, um, soul storm, the enhanced station, you know, we, we had some problems at launch uh, for reasons we kind of touched on, but mm -hmm. we resolved you know, as much as we possibly could. And so I think it's, you know, it's come a long way. But uh, that arrived on Xbox. So you have Soulstorm Enhanced Editions there. And then Stranger's Wrath also just released on Xbox. And uh, it's got some nice things going for it. It's the best looking one yet. And then um, uh, we're on the PS5 store, PS4 store. PS3 is really phasing out, right? 
but uh, we're on Nintendo, we're on the Switch, we're on um, Xbox, we're on what else? We're on we're on Switch. We're on uh, we were on the Nvidia uh, handheld devices as well. Mm-hmm. So we're pretty much everywhere. We're on Steam, Epic, and I I think there's some we're on Epic, uh, you know, which is an interesting store, an interesting future, an interesting technology, right? Like Epic, keep your eyes on Epic. Do you want um, to elaborate? I invite you to elaborate. Well, I just think they they if they see the world differently and who else can sue apple and google and win that's a very good way to point it put it it is a right? very just, good just, way to put it <laughs> there you go right and if you know these guys you know <laughs> jay wilbur and mark rain and tim sweeney and, and the other guys you know i mean they were just hardcore game developers man you know just uh the real deal and so seeing that they've actually become you know kind of a world power in a way it's just remarkable because they're the same people you know so it's, it's just interesting seeing that whole history really but is. uh you'll find it there and there's some news coming up on steam soon soon so i uh, can't wait to announce that but uh uh and of course you can follow Oddworld uh Oddworld inc on twitter and or is it Oddworld Inhabitants? I don't know. It's Oddworld. Sorry, it's not right in front of me. I'm really. It's always hot keyed, right? I'm never having to type it in. Don't worry. But, it's uh, Oddworld Inc. And there's, and there's Lauren Lanning, my Twitter, and there's Oddworld Inc. Twitter. There's the Facebook group, uh, Official Oddworld, which uh, has a lot of great discussions and stuff. There's the Discord groups, which is uh, Oddworld Discord, and um, I'm sure I'm missing something, but you know. It, it, there's a lot of stuff out there on all the different platforms. You just go to the store, and Google, it, and uh, search it. Sorry. See how that became a term? That stole it did. Search? It did. <laughs> yeah. I'm as gullible as everyone else. All right, Luke. Well, it's been a pleasure being on. I really, uh, I really enjoy your your questions, and uh, you know, I, I I look forward to the next time we're able to do this. Absolutely. I I thoroughly enjoyed it as well, and I can't thank you enough for agreeing to it, saying yes, and. Uh, giving me the chance to, to pick at your brain. It was an honor and I appreciate it. All right. Well, have uh, good luck cutting it. <laughs> and uh, I look forward to the next time. Thank you. Thanks, man. Take care. Bye-bye.